Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to one of the series offered to you by the Bayside History Museum and the Calvert Library. Before we get started, we have a couple housekeeping issues. Please turn off your cell phones. Please be careful if you whisper because the whole event is being recorded. And then the Bayside History Museum puts it out on YouTube so that if there's something that you would like to listen to again, you can go to any YouTube and this will probably be under, um, Dr. Eshelman has done so many wonderful talks for us, this one will probably be under Lighthouses or maybe the title of the talk. We'll see at the time what's out there. Um, Ralph really doesn't need an introduction. Almost everyone here knows who he is, but it's so nice that he continues to speak uh, in this state, in other countries, all over the world, and help educate people on things that are so very important. Um, prior to this talk, he gave us a wonderful lecture on all of the travels he had done in Antarctica, um, during the War of 1812 celebration. Um, he was requested so many times by so many groups, I think he probably went home and talked the War of 1812 in his sleep. But uh, anyway, we really appreciate him being here today. And before we get started, I certainly want to acknowledge our Mayor of Chesapeake Beach, Pat Mahoney. And then I have a special acknowledgement for our town council member, uh, Mickey Hummel, who not only serves on the town council for North Beach, but he's our IT go-to person. And he records all of these meetings for us. He's here if anybody needs help, if something is not working. And that is really worth a lot with today's technology and all of the different computer systems and everything that goes on. So we really do appreciate his commitment of time every time we have a lecture. Without further ado, one person who really does not need much of an introduction, Dr. Ralph Eshelman. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right, great. I want to thank the uh, Bayside History Museum and also Calvert uh, County Public Library for hosting this lecture series. And it's good to see so many faces. I see some new faces as well, but what a nice turnout for a beautiful uh, February day. You might be able to see from the title here that I don't even mention lighthouses. And I did that deliberately, and it might have been a mistake. But I try to encourage people to think outside the box. And most of us, when we think of a lighthouse, we think of lighthouses that we know about that are right here maybe in the Chesapeake Bay, like Drum Point Lighthouse or Cove Point Lighthouse. But if you think of lighthouses around the world, and if you go back early in the history of lighthouses, they did not really host lights. So is it proper to call them lighthouses if you're thinking about them in a global context? back to the beginnings of lighthouses. And they were actually referred to more commonly as sea marks because it was an attempt to build something on land to mark a hazard at sea. Not necessarily the best way to do it, but it was the best way that they knew back in those times. So I'm talking about during the times of the Greeks and the Romans and those kinds of periods, specifically into the Mediterranean. And if you go back to that period of time, not many people were sailing at night. Most people were not at sea deliberately at night. So lighthouses were actually smoke houses because the easiest way to indicate to vessels in the daytime where they are is to have smoke. And I don't know how many of you actually ever thought about that, but thus the title smoke by day and fire by night. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Everybody here has probably heard about Indians using smoke to signal. Well, you wouldn't do that at night, would you? So it was meant to communicate during the daytime. And how many of you are familiar with Magellan and his explorations? And Magellan was coming down trying to circumnavigate the world, and he believed that there was a way that he could get around what we call the New World 
and he found a passage, and that passage is named after him today. And what is the land to the south of that passage called? Anybody know? Land of fire. Land of fire. Terra del Fuego. And when the king heard about this, Magellan described it as the land of smoke, not the land of fire. It was the Fuegan Indians that he saw that had built these smoke signals all along that passage, announcing this mysterious, huge canoe coming through that they had never seen before. It scared them. Imagine what it was like for those people. But when he came back and said that, I want to name this new land, Terra del Smoke, <laughs> Fuma. They didn't, the king didn't like that. He didn't think that was very exciting. So instead from smoke, they called it the land of fire. So is history. So when you think about it, these are ways that people attempted to communicate in the early days before we had the capability to navigate at sea at night. Now I don't want to leave you with a false impression. There were cultures that had maritime abilities to navigate at night prior to the Greeks and prior to the Romans. Can any of you tell me a couple of examples? Chinese. The Chinese. How about the Norse? The Norse peoples? And the one that a lot of people never seem to think about, the Polynesians. Think about the navigation of the people that we call Polynesians today going for weeks at a time to explore and discover new islands in the South Pacific. So there were cultures that could do it. But when you think about cultures such as the Greek and the Romans and the Phoenicians and even later cultures, primarily they did not want to be at sea at the nighttime because they didn't have the navigation skills to be able to keep themselves from grounding in shallow areas or rocks that they didn't know about. And how many people know that the Roman Navy forbid their ships to be at sea at night in the Mediterranean? An hour before sunset, you were supposed to beach your vessels and establish a camp on land. And then the next morning, you would launch your vessels again and go on your way. This was a way of, of safety before we had the means of navigation that we have today. So that's really what the title is. A couple of uh, different newspapers announced this as a lecture about what does sea mark mean, which is pretty close to what we're going to talk about. And another one said that I'm going to talk about lighthouses of the Chesapeake Bay. Now how they came up with that from that title, I have no idea. So that's why I say maybe I was a little too far outside the box when I came up with this title. But nevertheless, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the lighthouses on the Chesapeake Bay. So let's go ahead and get started. Smoke by day, fire by night. So what would be examples that naturally occurred, particularly in the Mediterranean, that navigators were seeking? Volcanoes. Think about an erupting volcano in the, dead time, in the daytime. You've got smoke and cinder and steam coming out. It could be visible for many, many miles away. And at night, you could even have fountains of lava that are coming up. So this is a natural lighthouse in a sense, if you want to think about it that way, before mankind began to deliberately develop structures that would do that. Stromboli, at the tip of Italy. Think about the Mediterranean. One of the most difficult places to get around is the very tip of Italy because it sticks so far out into the Mediterranean. And what's right at the heel? Stromboli. And it's one of the most active volcanoes in the Mediterranean. And it, for hundreds of years, it's been erupting back and forth. And if you read some of the very early, they didn't call them pilot navigation guides, but people who wrote about that, they would mention this particular volcano. Keep a lookout for it. That was a way that they could see mark. How about Central America? How many of you have ever heard of the lighthouse of the Pacific? This erupted continuously from 1770 to 1958. Isn't it a beautiful cone? 
and this served as an aid to navigation. So these are natural aids to navigation. They're not made man. They're not man-made. My wife and I, in fact, this was a Calvert Marine Museum uh, international trip that we held back in the 1980s. We went to this little island called Dravuni Island. And Dravuni is translated to mean blood island, which is kind of interesting. There's only about 250 people that lived there. And this was a diving trip. We were going there to dive on the Astrolabe reefs, which are some of the most beautiful reefs in the world. And one day it was too windy. And so what do you do on a day when you can't go diving? You want to explore the island and you want to go to the very top so you can get the best views. So we went out to that top where you can see on that arrow right there. And what we found was a crude circle of stone. And you can see evidence of where a fire had been built. And it looks like the fire got out of control. <laughs> that night we went back to the village elders and we asked them what was that that we saw on the top of the mountain. And they said, if our fishermen go out at night and they don't get back, we send the young boys of the village up to the top of the hill to set a fire so that they can find that fire and find their way back home. Now that's not a lighthouse. It's not the kind of thing that we think of a lighthouse. But this is a very primitive way that people could help to navigate. And this is the kind of thing that has probably gone on around the world for hundreds if not over a thousand years. We asked the village elders, how long have you been doing that? And their comeback was, as long as we have been here. In other words, they don't know exactly when they got to that island, but we've been doing that as long as our memories can recall. Now, when I mention a lighthouse, most of you probably think of something like this. And the fact of the matter is that this is a very unusual lighthouse. It's because it's built out in the open ocean. <coughs> And most of the lighthouses in the world are not built in the open ocean. In fact, the technology to do that was very difficult, and it was not really perfected until as recently as 150 years ago. Now, the reason I'm showing you this particular one, it's Bell Rock, is because there's a legend, Sir Ralph. And since my first name is Ralph, I just felt compelled <laughs> to let you know that at least somewhere out in this world of history, there is also a Sir Ralph. And he actually crashed on the rocks there. It is said that he took the bell out because he was actually a pirate. And so what he wanted was for ships to deliberately wreck on those rocks mm -hmm. so that they then could go out and salvage the goods on the rocks. And as, as terrible as that sounds, this is the kind of thing that's also been done in many, many places in the world, including the United States. Do many of you know that at one time, you could get a wrecker's license, which meant that you had the right to go out and salvage ships that were crashed onto reefs, such as down in Florida. And there was a whole band of people that lived in Key West that made their living by going out and salvaging wrecks. And when the lighthouse was going to be built by the US government, they were not too happy about it. <laughs> and so they actually deliberately tried to keep at force the workmen from being able to come in to build that lighthouse. And the U.S. government had to bring in the army to allow the completion of the lighthouse. When I think of lighthouses, just like many of you do, you tend to think of water. Probably most of you think of ocean. But how many of you think about the Chesapeake Bay? Think of all of the lighthouses in the Chesapeake Bay, and that's not really an ocean. Think about some of the rivers in the Chesapeake Bay, like the Potomac, that have lighthouses that go up through the Potomac. Think of the Mississippi River that has lighthouses. Think of the Hudson River that has lighthouses. Think of the Great Lakes. What state in the United States has more lighthouses than any other state in the Union? Michigan. It's not even on the ocean. But how many of you ever thought about lighthouses on land to help navigate people on land. And you're looking at one right here. Can you see the lighthouse? It's right there. This is the Atacama Desert in South America, the driest desert in the world. 
Why would someone go to the expense to put a lighthouse in the middle of the desert? And the reason is he owned a hacienda right here at Matia, which is still a, a village there. And he would offer lodging to people who were traveling. He would offer water from the oasis that was there. He would offer food. And he would offer fodder for your animals. This was a way to make money, folks. Many of you think lighthouses are there to serve humanity. And that's a great way to look at it. But why do governments put up the expense for lighthouses? It's to encourage safe trade. It's a way to make money. Money is what turns the world. That's what this guy was doing in the Atacama Desert, and that's why the United States government, how many of you know this? The first public works program in the history of the United States was to complete a lighthouse at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, the Cape Henry Lighthouse. First public works project. Wouldn't you think it would be a Capitol building? Maybe a home for the president? No. Because what had we done? We had just knocked off most of our trade with England because we declared war for independence. England wasn't too happy with us. So by building a lighthouse at the mouth of the Chesapeake, we were encouraging foreign countries to come in and hopefully safely be able to enter the bay and trade with us. It was for money. I'm not going to read that because I've already gone way beyond my time. How many of you know about the seven wonders of the ancient world? You know, they change that every once in a while. How many of the seven ancient wonders of the ancient world were lighthouses? Had you thought about that? Well, obviously, there's one. The Colossus of Rhodes. The Colossus of Rhodes, I, I heard that in the back. Whoever that is, you get a gold star. There you go. Think about the pharaohs of Alexandria. Where was that located? At the mouth of the Nile River. That's a pretty important place. And this is considered to be the first true lighthouse that was ever built in the world. We don't know a whole lot about it. There's no photographs. There's not even any contemporary drawings that have survived. But we do have some diary entries that describe it. And some of them even tell you the color of the stone. It's estimated that it was probably 350 feet tall. Now, what do you see at the very top? Smoke. Smoke. These are other depictions of the pharaohs of Alexandria. Now, I'll be honest with you, I deliberately picked those depictions that show smoke. <laughs> there are some artists that have tried to depict that it had the ability to reflect light. What do you see in the middle there? What is that? Anybody recognize it? That's the George Washington Masonic Temple in Alexandria, Virginia. When you take the beltway, you can see that. How many of you know that this was inspired by the pharaohs of Alexandria? This is the largest model of a lighthouse in the world. 333 feet tall. And what do you see at the very top? It's a tripod with an open bowl, which is a replica of what many of these depictions are attempting to show, which is where they would burn something to make smoke. Now, my question to you is, if you've ever been to that part of the world, there's not a whole lot of forest out there. So what, what were they burning? Had you ever thought about it? There's no accounts that say what they were using to make smoke. But there's two logical possibilities. One is that along the Nile, it was famous for its reeds. Many of their boats were made out of reeds. If you burn reeds, it makes smoke. The other thing that they had a lot of was camel dung. Dried camel dung makes smoke. How would you like to be a lighthouse keeper back in those days? <laughs> this is the Colossus of Rhodes. 
Now again, we have no photographs, we have no contemporary drawings, we really don't know what it looks like. We have some diary entries that say that it was a statue where the legs stretched across the entrance to the harbor. And supposedly it was 110 feet tall. Imagine a bronze statue. This is the largest statue that was built up to this time in the world. 110 feet tall. That's an engineering feat. That's why it's one of the ancient wonders of the world. We don't know absolutely for sure if it was a lighthouse. It certainly was a major monument for ships that were coming into the harbor there. What does that remind you of? Is this just by chance? No. The man, the Frenchman who designed the Statue of Liberty based it on many of the depictions of the Colossus of Rhodes. And what's interesting, and a lot of Americans don't even know this, is that when it was built, it was used as a lighthouse to mark the harbor of New York City. And so you would surmise, okay, well, the light was, had to be up there, right? The light was actually right here. And with a series of mirrors, the light was reflected right out of the crown, down the harbor. When ships would come in, this is before the Verrazano <clears throat> Bridge and all that kind of business, that's where they would be heading, right looking at that light, heading to the Statue of Liberty. The first electrified lighthouse in the United States. And when you walk inside, <clears throat> hardly anybody ever notices this, but immediately on the left wall is this bronze plaque. And I don't know if you can read it, but the bronze plaque is entitled <coughs> The New Colossus. There's no doubt that the architect had this in mind when he designed it. And then if you go down further, you'll read the words that many of you are familiar with. Your huddled masses, etc., etc., etc. It's all on that plaque which is under the new Colossus. Nobody tells you that. The park rangers, I love the National Park Service, they don't tell you it's the new Colossus. It's the Statue of Liberty. It wasn't even called the Statue of Liberty when it was first built. That's a name that came in later. If we go back in the Roman period, here's a coin. You can make out a ship. This looks like a lighthouse to me. And this is an artist's depiction of what maybe that would have looked like. But up here, they made a big boo-boo. The Romans did not have the ability to reflect light like lighthouses do today. This is a mosaic, a floor mosaic. Some dolphins, some ships. That looks like a lighthouse to me. Have any of you been to the White Cliffs of Dover? Have you been to Dover Castle? You may have been there, and you missed, to me, one of the most interesting things that's there. And it's this tower right here. That's a Roman lighthouse tower. And guess what? If you go across the English Channel, what we call the English Channel today, and for what is France today, there's a reciprocal tower almost identical to that. And what it means is that back in the Roman period, if you didn't have fog or heavy rain or whatever, all you had to do was to keep smoke in front of you and smoke in back of you in the daytime, or fire in front of you and fire behind you at nighttime, and you could go across the channel. These worked in a system. <clears throat> Now, for those of you that are architecturally inclined or into preservation, you probably notice that the top appears to look different than the bottom. You notice that the bottom is much more worn. It doesn't seem to have that sharpness that the upper part has. Notice the difference in the proportions of the windows. There's a reason for that. And that's because a church was built next to it. There's the church right there. And this was incorporated into the church to be the bell tower. Mm -hmm. And the bell tower has to be bigger, taller than the church. So this was added at the same time that they built the church. That's not part of the original lighthouse. Interesting how things change over time. 
And then this is a more contemporary drawing showing you more what it would have looked like and then the tower that was put on the top. And then this is just another example. This is a, a Roman ship with the sails and in the back that appears to be a tower. When did they fire with an actual flame coming out? Now this is a contemporary sculpture that was done from the Roman period. And then <clears throat> this is just another example of a very early lighthouse. We're talking here about the 15, 1600s. But here you can see a crane that was used to bring up the materials that would be burned in this open cage. This would be made out of metal. And they would either burn wood or they might burn coal or who knows what it might be. So this was an open fire that could create smoke in the daytime and could create fire at night. Another clever way to do it, however, is that if you have an open flame and you're getting near a civilized area, you're getting near a town, lots of people tend to have candles. And a lot of people have oil lamps that are burning in their windows. And you're out on a ship and you're trying to figure out, okay, which is the light that I'm supposed to be using to determine where to get into this harbor or wherever I want to go. So they came up, particularly in the Scandinavian countries, with what's called a lever light. And what it is is a tripod. You've got a lever over the top, and you can see there's a harness here so that it can be raised and lowered. And then this is your iron open basket, and in there you would put your fuel, and that's where the light would be. And what would the light keeper do? He would stand here and raise and lower the lever all night. He probably went out and hired somebody to do it. And what that would mean is that as you're coming along the coast, all of the other lights would be pretty much the same, but one would be going up and down. And then maybe further down the coast at the next port, there the guy would pull it back and forth so the light would be going horizontal. And then you go down the coast, and not to confuse it with the other two you've already seen, they might have two levers. And one's going up, and one's going this way, and you could do all kinds of combinations, and the navigator knew what that meant. When they saw that depiction, that particular way that the light is being exhibited, they knew that's where they were. That's how lighthouses work today. But they do it in a flash pattern. Now, you will hear some people say that every lighthouse in the world has a different flash pattern. That's not true. You don't need to have a different light pattern from, let's say, the Mediterranean to the east coast of the United States. People are not going to confuse the Mediterranean with the east coast of the United States. You could have the same light pattern. But next time you're out at night, look at the different patterns. Even the buoys. You have lit buoys that have different patterns. And by looking at the pattern, you can then open up the pilot book and you can determine exactly where you are. So even if all of your aids to navigation fail for whatever reason, you can still do that. This is just another example of a lever light. I don't have a whole lot of time, more than I'd like to talk about than we always have time, but at a stone lighthouse, 1699, this was the first attempt to build an open ocean lighthouse. This was off the port of Plymouth, England, in the English Channel. And there was a rock out there called Eddystone Rock. And it was only visible at extreme low water. And all of the ships coming in there would go very close to these rocks. They were extremely dangerous. So they put out a reward for the first successful person who could build a lighthouse to keep ships from hitting that rock. And this is the first attempt. It looks very Victorian, doesn't it? These are all the different types that were built until finally this one was the, perf the perfected lighthouse that won the award. The reason these did not win the award is that they were built so poorly that during storms they would succumb to the storm. This particular one right here, it doesn't look like it, but it's built out of wood and it caught on fire. <laughs> This one was pretty good. It was built out of different stones that were put together 
But the rock on which it was built eroded underneath of it and it became unstable. And so they had to take it down. This is the final one that still stands today. That's the Edistone White right there. So you can see how it's changed over time. This is the wooden structure, and then this is the stone structure built right there. Okay, it doesn't want to work. What's going on? I think my battery might have just gone bad. Any advance? Or maybe... Uh, this popped up on his battery. For some reason it's not reading. Okay. Wait a minute, I think we have it. I think it might be a weak battery. Let's go. Try not. Okay. Did it just uh, freeze up? There we go. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to move through here very quickly because of time. This is what made it survive. You see all these different stones have different shapes. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. So by putting in a stone like this, it's impossible for that stone to come out without the stones around it to also come out. And then on top of that, in some places, they would put a projection into the next course to help it to be more firm. And then on top of that, all of these black dots that you see right here represent where holes were drilled through the stones, and then wooden dowels were driven from one course into another. And what happens when wood gets wet? It expands, and it helps to hold it together even better. So this was a major, major technological accomplishment which allowed for the first open ocean lighthouse to be considered a success. And I'm going to do you a favor, and I'm not going to sing the song for you. But for those of you that were into folk music like I was when I was younger, you probably remember the song, the Eddie Stone Light. I'll just read the first. My father was the keeper of the Eddie Stone Light, and he slept with a mermaid one fine night. Out of that union came three, a porpoise and a porgy, and the other was me. A porgy is a type of fish. I mean, it's a great, great song. Many of you may remember it. The Brothers Four sang it. I can't remember some of the others. But this is very popular, as you might imagine, particularly in England. What were some of the other technological advances? Remember I mentioned to you a cast metal open basket? Well, what happens when the wind is blowing toward the land? That's, so the smoke is coming toward the land. Or if you're out at sea and it's blowing out to sea, then the smoke is coming out toward where you are. You're not going to be able to see the fire very well. So they came up with a lantern. And think about that. That meant you're no longer affected by the wind. But it was even better than that because the ventilators down here at the bottom, that's where the oxygen would come in. And that meant that the fire would burn universally 360 degrees all the way around. For those of you that have ever gone camping, you know that there's one side of the place of the fire to sit that's better than another, and it never tends to burn universally. With this kind of a system, it does. And then on top of that, because this is all now heated, all of the soot and the smoke and the heat goes out through the top. So this was a major, major accomplishment when you think about it. It's called a lantern. Lighthouses do not have cupolas. They have lanterns. The other major advantage was coming up with what's referred to as a parabolic reflector. If this is your light source, that light is going out in every direction possible. But if you put a reflector behind it, and the reflector is designed to take that light to hit that reflector and then bounce back out at a beam, you're going to increase what's called the candle power. So it's going to be a more powerful light that can be seen at sea. So these were another major accomplishment. But then probably, well, this is an example from a church uh, right here in uh, Southern Maryland where they're using a parabolic reflector. And that's this fellow called Fresnel. The name, you would think it's pronounced Fresnel, but it's Fresnel. And what he devised is something that was even beyond the first two technological advances. He devised a series of prisms made out of glass that would reflect and refract the light. So light that's coming up in these directions and down in that direction gets reflected and refracted out in a single direction, like a beam. 
So this increased also the candle power. These are some of the different examples of the sizes of these lenses that were designed by this fellow by the name of Fresnel. And believe it or not, there are still Fresnel lenses that are used in lighthouses around the world. If you go to Cove Point Lighthouse, you'll see a Fresnel lens. If you go to Drum Point Lighthouse, you can see a Fresnel lens. But they're dying. They're being replaced because they're expensive to maintain. This is the largest. There's, this is called a parabolic reflector. And these are used in places where you have vast open oceans. So think of a great place where a lighthouse like this would be used in the Hawaiian Islands. <coughs> so in the United States, this is an example of where you have to go to see one of the largest <laughs> Fresnel lenses that's ever been developed. Look at the size of the things. I mean, you could have two people standing in size of that. Can you imagine how much it would cost to build something like that? And then they went beyond that. Instead of having a beam that went 360 degrees, then they came out with bullseye lenses so that all of this light is getting reflected and refracted and coming out in a single beam. And then if you rotated this whole assembly, and let's say you have three of these up there, you're going to get three flashes as it goes around. Boom, boom, boom. And depending on the speed, you could get nine flashes in a minute, you could get three flashes in a minute, who knows what. That's one of the ways that they would come up with these ways of helping people at sea to know exactly where they were, the flash pattern. The other thing you can do is you can put up a red sector. So if you're coming into a harbor or someplace and you're beginning to see a red light, that's not good. What that means is that you've gotten out of the channel and you need to get yourself positioned back to where you're seeing a white light. So these are called red panels. And one of the most famous red panels is Europa Lighthouse. Anybody ever hear of Europa Lighthouse? It's at Travolta. It's at the entrance to the Mediterranean, a very significant place. And you can see up here at the top, at the direction that this photograph was taken, white light, and you can see the red sectors on the sides. So if you're coming into the mouth of the Mediterranean and you get into a red sector, it's time for you to find out why you're there. You're in the wrong place. This is what it looks like on the inside. And then you can even have a green sector. Up in Canada, there's a famous lighthouse that has a red and a green and a white sector. Not too many of those. What happens if your, your electric bulb burns out? Well, they've got them now that they have automatic changers. And by the way, this is the modern type of lenses that are used today. It's actually Fresnel. It still reflects and it refracts, but it's made out of plastic. So these would be several hundred dollars as opposed to several hundred thousand dollars. And then if you're in a remote area and your keeper doesn't get out there very often, you could have a series of light bulb changes like that. Have you ever heard of aero beacon lights? Remember back when airports? I remember when National used to have a beacon that went around. The first time I ever flew out of it. They don't do that anymore, they don't need it. But planes would actually use these. And these aero beacon lights are used in lighthouses today. And you can see the parabolic reflector behind it. That's a thousand watt light bulb right there. Very, very powerful. And these can be turned at any rate you want. You can set the speed. <clears throat> this is just a close-up of what one of those would look like. And then these are the more modern types. And in case you're wondering, these are not <clears throat> antennas. These are anti-seagull devices. <laughs> <laughs> because these are all solar panels, and seagulls tend to poop all over them, and then that makes it bad because you're not getting that solar energy that you need for these things to operate. And then these are LEDs. You can have any color you want, and you can fix them up into stacks. There's all different ways you can do it. And these are what the modern lights are being used today. Much less expensive, and they're relatively maintenance-free compared to what 
the earlier Fresnel lenses were. And this is another example. Very powerful. This is America's equivalent of Edison White. This is a United States' first successful open ocean lighthouse. This is Minot's Ledge. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, but Minot's Ledge marked the entrance to Boston Harbor, one of the most important harbors on the east coast of the United States. And what's interesting about it is that it's known as the I Love You Lighthouse because the flash pattern is one flash, pause. Four flashes, pause. Three flashes, pause. That's the number of letters in I Love You. Only lighthouse on the east coast of the United States that has that flash pattern. And that's what it looks like on a beautiful day. And this is what it looks like on a normal day. And you can see that they stole the whole idea of the Edison light to build it with one major exception. This light was first built on land so that all of the stones could be precisely fitted. And then they were all numbered by course and how they were set. And then they went out and they started on the foundation. And this was taken from a man in a rowboat whose only job was to holler when a wave was coming. <laughs> he would holler wave. All of these men would grab onto these wires and whatnot. You had your own tools. You weren't provided with other tools, so you wanted to take care of your tools. And if anybody got washed overboard, his job was to row up to them, pull them on board, not to take them home, to take them back to work. <laughs> this is before OSHA and all that kind of stuff. This is back when men really so here it is being built on land before they took it out and built it out there. Made it a whole lot faster and actually better. How many of you have heard of screw piles? For any of you that are sailors, you probably have heard of the screw pile challenge and all these kinds of things. Chesapeake Bay has more screw pile lighthouses than any other place in the world of equal size. And the reason for it is the Chesapeake Bay is ideally suited for screw pile lighthouses because there's no rock. It's essentially sand and mud and clay and that kind of thing. And so what you're looking at here, these are the screw piles from Drum Point Lighthouse. After the lighthouse was moved to the Calvert Marine Museum, they didn't take the screw piles, which were dug into the bottom. These were later extracted because it was considered a hazard to navigation. And these were laying on the beach. And the Marine Museum, I think, got three of them and conserved them. And some of the other museums in the Chesapeake Bay, whatever, they also got some of them. But it shows you what it looked like. And the thing that amazes me is that when these were built, they would build a platform over the site where the lighthouse was going to be built. And then they would set this in a frame at a right <coughs> angle, because sometimes they would go down at angles. They didn't necessarily go down straight. And then they had big levers that were welded onto the top of it. And on the game plank up on the top, men would turn these giant screws into the mud. So you're actually screwing this whole pile into the bottom. And once that's in place, then you move your platform to where the next screw pile is going to go. And that's how they build screw pile lighthouses. It's really quite an engineering feat. This is uh, at uh, Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum uh, after restoration. You can see a big difference. It's like a big giant wood screw when you think about it. And so there's the lighthouse today after it got moved. And that's all they moved is that section right there. Everything below it, screw pile lighthouse, the most important part is this screw pile. And they don't have the screws. <laughs> This is what Trump Point looked like soon after it was built. And you'll notice it's way offshore. Oops, let's go back. And this is what it looked like in 1974 when it got moved. And so what I'm showing you is all of this land between here and there has completely built up. You know, we hear today about how the shorelines are eroding. Well, there are places in the Chesapeake Bay and other places in the world where the shoreline is accreting, usually at the expense of beaches further up. And that's what's actually happened right here at Trump Point. 
And then it was moved, ironically, by a steam crane, a steam-operated crane, by BF Diamond Construction Company, which just happened to be in the Chesapeake because they were building the Governor Thomas Johnson Bridge, which opened in December of 1977. They began work in 1975. And I can't go into the details of how it all worked out, but let's just say that there was a very prominent judge in the community who was holding court with a company for illegally dumping materials into the river, and they reached a compromise. <laughs> now, we talked about lights, but think about day marks. Remember, we used to use smoke in the day. Well, today we use day marks. So this is Currituck Beach. If you haven't been to Currituck Beach, that's the northern parts of the Outer Banks of North Carolina. A beautiful, beautiful lighthouse. And it's left in its natural state. This is salmon brick. That's the color. Pilot book, salmon brick red. It's not painted. It's just left its natural color. But acetate light, alternating bands of red and white. Body Island. Some people say Bodie. The locals say Body. Body Island. Alternating bands of black and white. I think everybody knows about the famous Cape Hatteras, which has the spiral pattern. How about Cape Lookout with the diamond pattern, which marks Diamond Shoals, which is just offshore. So, you know, a mariner can, okay, diamond pattern, diamond shores, I know where I am. Checkerboard all different colors all around the world. Remember I talked about the first public works program in the United States. That's it right there. That's the original Cape Henry Lighthouse. This is the replacement. This is the tallest cast iron lighthouse built in the United States, over 200 feet tall. It has an original first order Fresnel lens still operating on the top of it. It's very unusual to go anywhere in the world and be able to see two lighthouses together. This, the earliest one, replaced by the later one. Because usually they tear down the older one and build it on the same place. They didn't do that there. This is back when the United States used a little bit more money to make things kind of look a little bit nicer than maybe they do today. But this beautiful mosaic tile floor is in the basement area of this lighthouse. And these three arrows are pointing to little <coughs> alcoves. And that's where big oil tanks were located. Every time a lighthouse keeper would walk up the stairs, he would carry a five gallon bucket of oil. Well, think about that. That's over 200 feet to the top. <laughs> Those were the good old days. <laughs> you get up into the maritime uh, provinces of, Nova, of uh, Canada, they, they tend to like the verticals. And almost all of them tend to be uh, red and white. This is Sullivan Island. I don't know how many of you have ever been there. This is in uh, South Carolina. To me, this is the ugliest lighthouse in the United <laughs> States. It's one of the most recent lighthouses built in the United States. But it's interesting for two reasons. Number one, it has an elevator. It's the only lighthouse in the United States with an elevator. Number two, it's three-sided. It's the only triangular-shaped lighthouse built in the United States. And I challenge any of you to take a picture that shows all three sides at one time. <laughs> the light that was put at the top was so bright that it only lasted for seven years before the government took it out and put in a less brilliant light because it was actually harmful to the people that were looking at the light. <coughs> so technology can go too far sometimes. How many of you have ever heard of range lights? We don't have too many range lights in this area, but you get up to Baltimore, they've got them. If you've ever come in the Delaware River, there's more range lights on the Delaware River than any other place in the United States. And that's because the channel is so sinuous. And what range lights are is where you have two lights, one is shorter than the other. So as you're coming in as a navigator, all you need to do is to line up the two lights so the short light and the tall light are right over top of each other. And that means you're in the channel. But if the lights are like this or like that, you're not in the channel. You need to get that corrected. And this is what you're looking at right here. 
This is also typical of the Great Lakes, coming into harbors on the Great Lakes. Here's your short tower, here's your tall tower. You line those two babies up, and there's the channel coming right in to where the harbor is. How many of you have ever gone down Route 301 in Delaware and see these what look like silos sitting out in the middle of the cornfield? These are the rear range lights for the Delaware River. You know the new Delaware Route 1? A lot of people take that now when you're heading north. You can see them off of there as well. This is the rear range light for the Delaware River. This is a rear range light for the Delaware River. This is the keeper's house. And that's his garage. He doesn't have a boathouse because he's four miles from the water. His children go by bus to school. He has a garden. It's very different from most other lighthouse keepers that don't have that kind of situation. And then I used to be able to say this is the most modern type of lighthouses in the world. It's not. These are big platforms that were built using the technology of the oil drilling industry. You know, the platforms that they use for drilling rigs, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico. These were adopted to build lighthouses, particularly out along the east coast of the United States, which is relatively shallow water. But these became so expensive that they were all decommissioned and all of them are gone today. Because imagine, everything had to be brought out by helicopter. Personnel, food, everything you needed had to be brought out by helicopter. Very, very expensive. On the west coast of the United States, the water's too deep. So instead, they have what are called large navigation buoys that are anchored to the bottom. And inside of this are all types of batteries. There's solar up on the top. You've got a fog signal. And here's an antenna. It has a light. Everything that you need right there. So it can communicate with the nearest Coast Guard station. That's their aids to navigation on the west coast of the United States. These are what they look like today where they can put a pile in the water. <coughs> this is the replacement of the Chesapeake platform. The previous one I showed you, that's what it looks like today. So think about the difference in maintenance between the two. It's completely unmanned, and it's solar powered. This gizmo that you see up at the top is kind of like a spiral that's built so that when you have heavy winds, it causes the wind to spiral around the pile instead of actually put inertia against the pile. It has a fiberglass outing that is the color of what you want it to be. It could be red, it could be blue, it could be white, whatever you want. So it doesn't have to be painted. And it's powered by solar energy. It has a fog signal, it has a light, and it has radio communication. When it's beginning to weaken for whatever reason, it tells the Coast Guard station, my battery needs to be changed. My light bulb needs to be changed. It's kind of like a baby. It's just, it's amazing. And so, this particular aid to navigation, the Coast Guard may come out there once or twice a year. So think about how much money is saved. Not as dramatic. And then this is, this is crazy. This is a plastic lighthouse. This is where people are going today. This is in China. This is a typical type of a lighthouse that's now being built, again, so that you don't have any maintenance involved with it, all automated, just to make things as inexpensive and maintenance-free as possible. We haven't talked about sound. We've talked about light. We've talked about day marks. But when you can't see a day mark, when you can't see your lighthouse, you're going to depend upon sound. You can also depend upon radio waves. Lighthouses also put out radio waves so that they can be monitored by ships. Even if they can't see it, they know that's where the lighthouse is. But before that was, technology was present, they primarily used sound. So here is a bell, and as that buoy would rock, you can see how these hammers would strike the side of the bell. And then these are gongs. I don't know if you can make it out very well, but there's four gongs, one set on top of each other. And these are also, um, as it washes, uh, will put out a nice sound. And you can also see there's a solar operation up on the top and a light on the top as well. 
This is a fog signal station up at Split Rock in Minnesota on Lake Superior. These are steam trumpets with steam generators on the inside. These steam trumpets could be heard four to five miles out into Lake Superior. Amazing, amazing things. And a lot of people don't realize, but down here is the Golden Gate Bridge. And this is Fort Point. Many of you may have been there. Um, on the opposite side, in this fog, there's a station there, and its only purpose is fog. It's a fog signal station. There's another one at uh, Manitou Island, um, which is off of the coast of Maine. Those are the only two stations I know of in the United States where their only job is only fog. There's no light or anything else revolved there. And these are what some of the fog signals look like. In the olden days, you'd have to wind up like with a clock mechanism so that it was a weight-driven, like a grandfather clock that would strike the fog bell. If you go to Drum Point Lighthouse and you ever take the tour there, you can see one of those mechanisms that's in place. So about every two hours, the keeper would have to wind it back up, and then the weight would allow it to clong as long as it was needed to take care of fog. In later years, they came up with automatic fog signals that would send out a beam, and when the beam did not reflect back at a certain distance, it knew that it was time for it to turn itself on. And so these are some of the examples that you see right here. And here's the light, and that's where it would bounce off of, and if it can't bounce off of there, that light, that uh, fog signal will automatically come on. And then how about light ships? I know there's no one in this room except for possibly Don and myself that can go back to 1979. <clears throat> but that's when the Columbia light ship was decommissioned. 1979. That's not that long ago when you really think about it. They were still using light ships. And in the Chesapeake, they used it up till 1971. It's amazing. And then Chesapeake Bay. Look, pull the cord on me when you need to. Um, <laughs> this is a map that shows 64 lighthouses in the Chesapeake Bay. It's not really complete, however, because right here is uh, the big turn in the Potomac River at Cedar Point. And there's actually two lights there to help people to navigate around. But I just wanted to help you to understand that even in the Chesapeake Bay, there's a lot of lighthouses. And then these are some early charts. This is 1932. This is the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. And can you make out these yellow in here? Mm -hmm. These are all lighthouses. So this is 1832. And then this is 1834. And the reason I'm showing it to you is that, can you make that out? That's a light ship right there. That's the, the symbol for light ship. And it, this particular light ship had two lights on it to make it distinct from the other lighthouses. And if you have really good eyes, there's a lighthouse right there, there's a lighthouse right there, and there's a lighthouse right there. So what are some of the different types of lights in the Chesapeake? The earliest ones were rubble and brick towers. No big surprise there. So if you go out to Poles Island, very few people have ever been out there. This is in the upper part of the bay. Many of you might have been to Concord Point, which is up near Habit of Grace. These are made out of rubble stone. So that means that these are stones that aren't necessarily well-dressed, that they're going to fit well together, but they're held together by concrete. This is Coe Point Lighthouse right here in Calvert County, which is built out of brick. So you'll notice that the side is smoother because the bricks are going to get together easier than some of these cobblestones, rubble stone, whatever you want to call it. Interestingly, all three of those lighthouses were built by the same man. His name was Donahue. Donahue built the first seven lighthouses in the Chesapeake Bay. Then we also have screw pile lighthouses. You already know about Drum Point Lighthouse. Most people are familiar with the Thomas Point Shoal Lighthouse. What many of you may not know is that before Thomas Shoal was built, Thomas Shoal Lighthouse was on land, three miles away, trying to mark the shoal out there. And can you guys make this out right there? You're not going to see that anywhere else in the Chesapeake Bay. That's an icebreaker. When ice forms in the bay, which is not going to happen this year, I don't think, and then it begins to get, come out with the tides, 
that ice can build up behind a screw pile lighthouse, and there's instances where screw pile lighthouses have been plucked out of the bottom. That's not good. So they put an icebreaker right out here in the front to help to break up that ice before it reaches the lighthouse. And this is the lighthouse over at Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. This is the first lighthouse moved in the Chesapeake Bay. And then this is a seven foot, foot shoal, which is moved to uh, Baltimore Harbor. Here's Sharps Island. These are caisson lighthouses. In other words, it's a big cylinder that's sunk into the bay. All of the mud and the rock or whatever's inside is taken out, then it's filled up with cement. It makes a good, stable foundation. These were built to replace screw pile lighthouses because they were deemed that they were less susceptible to ice damage. However, Sharps Island got hit by ice as well as got scoured on one side and now it has this permanent lean to it. And the Coast Guard was interested in coming in and trying to right it. But so many people were upset by that, they actually like it. <laughs> It's kind of like it's part of our history. So the, light, the Coast Guard has kept it that way. And then Lazaretto, a lot of people don't even know there was a lighthouse up in Baltimore Harbor. This is a replica. This is a Craig Hill. This is a range light up in Baltimore. You can see this right off of North Point if you've ever been up there. And then this is the lighthouse at Alexandria, Virginia, Jones Point. And it's operated by the National Park Service. And you can go, and at certain times of the year, you can even go inside. And then, uh, should I stop? Yeah, because you want time for questions. OK. I was just going to very quickly talk about how lighthouses can influence us as a culture. And we have banks, we have homes, we have water towers. We even have a movie theater up in Annapolis that used the, the motif, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But with that, I'm going to stop because these good folks need to get out of here, and I'm sure you have things you want to do this, this evening. If anyone has any questions, we'll take a few, but I always tend to go long, so I apologize. Yes, sir. I have a question about the fog house thing. So I'm picturing myself when the Golden Gate Bridge, does it blow a sound? Yes. On a regular basis? No, only when there's fog. And there was also a uh, fog system that was put on Alcatraz Island. And I don't know if you know that, but there's a lighthouse on Alcatraz Island. And when they changed it from the bell to what was called a, uh, what do they call it, a whistle, a uh, steam-operated whistle, the people in the San Francisco area were so used to the old bell system <coughs> that they didn't like the new system. And so they complained to the federal government, but the federal government never changed it because it was a much more effective hearing uh, aid for navigation. So when there is fog, okay, how often does it blow the sound? I mean, Just like a light, it has its own system. So it may blow, let's say, for two seconds every four seconds. It may blow for three seconds every five seconds. And that's another way that you can go into your pilot book. You can find out exactly what fog system that is based upon the signal that it sends out. And it just keeps going while the fog's there? Correct. Okay. I live on Patuxent River near Helen Creek, if anybody knows where that is. And I used to be able to hear the fog system at Cove Point Lighthouse. And I would say that's easily four miles from my home. And it was not a bad sound. I liked it. It was a, a, it was a pleasant sound, but I could hear it. I don't hear it anymore. I think it's because of my hearing. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. The Dominion has two lighthouses, or two horns on either end of it. Because I can hear them when it's foggy. So although maybe that's the reason. I don't know if everybody could hear that, but the gentleman was, was stating that at the ends of the uh, LNG platform at Cove Point, they have two apparently fog signals there, which maybe have replaced the Cove Point system, which would make sense. And they're not as loud as what I used to be able to hear. So maybe my hearing's not as bad. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Was there a period of time, uh, the group of uh, lighthouses out of the bay, where they were maybe decommissioned, but were uh, actually offered for rental, like for summer cottage kind of thing? Yeah, the question is, were any of these lighthouses specifically screw pile lighthouses, decommissioned and then offered uh, for people to be able to rent. 
It has happened in other lighthouses, but not screw pile lighthouses. If you're familiar with uh, Baltimore Light, which, by the way, is the first nuclear-powered lighthouse, that was decommissioned, and periodically, general services will put them up for auction. If the federal government does not want them for any use, oftentimes fish and wildlife will take them because they want to preserve bird habitat or whatever. If a local jurisdiction like a state does not want it, they will offer it for sale to the public. And there are three families in the Annapolis area who bought Baltimore Light. Mm -hmm. And they have renovated it, and they don't rent it out to people, but that's where they go to kind of get away from the busyness of the work week and that kind of thing. So there are uh, many lighthouses that are now privately owned, mm -hmm. and there are also many lighthouses that are put up for, for rent. Calvert Marine Museum operates Cove Point Lighthouse, which is a has a duplex keeper's quarters. And you can rent that for a day, for a week, for as long as you want. I'm astounded at how much money they get. But it's essentially you have your own private place. I mean, it's all fenced in with a beautiful view of the river. And people go there to go sharks tooth collecting. Whatever. Okay. Yes, ma'am. One last question. I, I was going to say, I just was at a talk, and Thomas Point Lighthouse is owned by the city of Annapolis. Actually, the uh, I'm going to just make a s small correction. Thomas Point Shoals Lighthouse is owned and operated by the U.S. Lighthouse Society. However, all of the operations, as far as the tours and whatever, are handled by the Annapolis Maritime Museum. So it's a very nice partnership. They just had a big fundraiser. I can't remember, was it in January? And they raised at that fundraiser about $120,000 um, because it needs some major repair work. And that's because so many people like Thomas Point Soul Lighthouse. I mean, that's, do you know all the law firms and realty firms that use that as their logo? Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a chance to show you, but if you ever find a police vehicle over in St. Michael's, which is on the eastern shore, they have the logo of, which I can't remember which lighthouse it is, Holland Strait? Hooper Strait. Hooper Strait. Hooper Strait Lighthouse, yes, is on each one of their police cars. Because it means something to them. That lighthouse is part of that maritime <coughs> museum that brings in people, brings in outside dollars. So yeah. Okay, thank thank you all very much. I'll I'll take some questions.